An argument over a dog peeing on a carpet escalates into a confrontation ending with three people dead and three others wounded. Richard Andrew Poplowski was a 23-year-old man who was living with his mother and his grandmother in the Stanton Heights neighborhood of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He often spoke fondly of his grandmother, but not so much of his mother. Richard had been fairly down on his luck. He hadn't had a good past few years. He had first gotten married when he was 17 to a woman he met while he was in juvie. The marriage didn't go very well, lasting only two years. His divorce left him very troubled, but he was able to move on to a new girlfriend. He had previously enlisted into the U.S. Marine Corps, but ended up throwing a food tray at his drill instructor and getting discharged from boot camp. His flashes of anger would not end here. His new relationship was not very healthy. In 2005, he ended up assaulting her outside of his home. She ended up getting an order of protection against him, which he promptly violated one month later by showing up outside her place of work, getting himself in trouble again. A little later, by 2007, he was posting on white supremacist forums about his hatred of minorities and an incoming government collapse and mild apocalypse. But he also spent just about as much time talking about weed and his dope pipes, adding that his mom was cool with it. So he tried a few other things. He had an internet talk show that didn't do too well. Then he got a job at a glass factory, but was fired. This all left him very upset. Then in March of 2009, he changed his online handle from Rich P to Braced for Fate, which might have implied that he was planning something, or at the very least, expecting something. Then, one month later, on the fateful day of April 4th, 2009, Richard and his mother got into an argument. Richard had adopted two pit bulls, one of which had peed all over his mother's carpet. She scolded him for this, which quickly turned into a fight. He got more and more threatening as he argued. This was the last straw for her, and she wanted him gone. She tried to kick him out, but he definitely didn't plan on going quietly. The argument eventually got so intense that his mom ended up calling 911. This wouldn't be the first time that the police responded to a call at this house. They had been there at least twice on similar calls before. The police chief would later say that Richard had been a problem in the past. He often got into fights with neighbors, even going as far as getting into fistfights before. This is a relatively really quiet neighborhood except for him. He was just one of those kids that we knew to stay clear from, said one neighbor. Shortly after 7 on that Saturday morning, the police responded to what they assumed was a regular domestic disturbance call. Before arriving, the officers were told by dispatch that there would be no weapons. Little did they know this call was far from normal. Richard, for some reason, planned on escalating this incident as much as he possibly could. The neighbors and police officers who were there that day would go on to call it the worst day of their lives. Two police officers arrived at the home and came to the front door. Richard's mother opened the door not knowing that her son was standing behind her, brandishing an AK-47. He was wearing a bulletproof vest, waiting for the cops to come open the door. The two officers, Paul Shulo II and Stephen Mayle, were completely ambushed. Shulo was shot in the head almost immediately as the door opened, and Mayle, who was standing behind him, was shot in the head directly after. Richard called a few of his friends as the chaos was about to begin. He called his best friend, telling him, Eddie, I am going to die today. Tell your family I love them, and I love you. The friend then heard gunshots over the phone, and Richard sounded as if he got hurt. He then called another one of his friends and told him that he loved him and that he thought he was going to die. He then started shooting at a third officer who was on the scene, Eric Kelly. He had been on his way home after finishing a long overnight shift when he heard a call for help on the radio. He rushed to the scene and started trying to help the other two downed officers. Officer Kelly was then shot in the arm and back. Richard, wearing his bulletproof vest, was decked out with an AK-47, an unspecified other rifle, and a pistol. The SWAT team was bound to show up, so he took a position at a bedroom window and began waiting. And once they came around, he started shooting at them. All of the residents of Stanton Heights were woken up that Saturday morning by the sound of a flurry of gunshots. 
One neighbor didn't immediately realize that the three big booming sounds he heard were gunshots. He innocently thought that the wind must have just knocked over some trash cans. He would soon realize how wrong he really was. Another police officer, Officer McManaway, arrived on scene and immediately began trying to help Kelly. He was shot and wounded in the process. He didn't stop assisting his fellow officer, who was a friend of his. He raised his arm, so I knew he was still alive, he said. Despite a bullet having torn through his left hand, he was able to grab a hold of Kelly and pull him behind a nearby car for protection. But it was already too late. He wanted me to give a message to his wife and kids, McManaway said. I told him I wouldn't deliver the message, he'd have to do it himself, but he would never get the chance to do so. His injuries were too severe, and it wouldn't have been possible to keep him alive in that state. Other officers and paramedics wanted to get to the injured officers, but were unable to. The deputy chief who lived nearby was one of the first to arrive. He saw mail to the right of the doorway, and he saw Kelly and McManaway kneeling behind a car trying to yell for help. But nobody could get close during the firefight. The victims were forced to lie there on the ground in that state. But the sad fact was, even if the paramedics were able to get to them, they most likely wouldn't have made it. The police chief suggested using a police car to get to them. They put a bulletproof vest up over the window to protect the driver long enough for a few officers to grab Kelly and McMahon away. Luckily, Richard was momentarily distracted while they did this and did not fire at them. We were fortunate that he didn't fire on us. I don't know why he was distracted, but he apparently didn't see us coming down to get them, he said. It could have been worse. After a long four-hour standoff, the police negotiators finally got Richard to surrender. By this time, he had already been shot at least one time in the leg. Over a hundred rounds had been fired by Richard and the SWAT team during the firefight. The original two officers to be shot were forced to lie where they fell throughout this whole period. Richard was swiftly taken into custody. Besides the three fatalities, there were two other injured officers as well. Luckily, they were in stable condition. Officer Kelly, Officer Mail, and Officer Shulo all passed away. Kelly had been on the force for 14 years in total, with Mail and Shulo having each been on for two years. McManaway, in addition to his injured hand, also broke his leg on a fence. Richard himself had taken several shots to one leg. His vest protected him from any other harm. He received treatment in a local hospital. Richard's mother had fled to the basement early in the attack and was therefore unharmed. After getting sufficient care, Richard was moved from the hospital to the Allegheny County Jail. He was charged with three counts of homicide, aggravated assault, and a weapons violation. We were walking into a blind situation, Officer Tim McManaway would go on to say during an interview with Good Morning America. How we're going to react is with the information that we have. The officers who died in this incident were the first to lose their lives in the line of duty in the city in over 18 years. This got as bad as it did because of an error in communication between the operators, the dispatchers, and the officers. The problem is, the officers were told before going that there would be no weapons involved, therefore their guard was very low. When Richard's mother called the police that day, she specifically warned the dispatchers that her son was heavily armed, but that message wasn't delivered to the cops. How did this happen? When the operator asked the mother if her son had any weapons on him, she said that yes, he did. When asked to confirm if she was being threatened with said weapons, the mother dodged the question and repeatedly asserted that she wanted Richard out of the house. Because she wasn't specifically being threatened with these weapons, the operator typed in, no weapons, which was then relayed to the dispatcher and subsequently the police officers. The fact that she was not being threatened with the weapons ended up being taken to mean that there were no weapons at all. I can't apologize enough, said the Allegheny County Emergency Services Chief Bob Full later on, but we can admit that there was an error made. We wish it would have been more black and white, that the officers would have at least been given notice that there were weapons in the house. He further stated that the particular 911 operator hadn't been in that position for more than one year, and that's including training. That employee was then put on administrative leave and offered to have counseling, likely feeling enormous guilt after this mistake. While in custody, Richard told police that he intended on having the cops kill him. 
but midway through he changed his mind. He decided that he would surrender and write a book in prison instead. Those who interviewed him described him as being unremorseful and added that he had a very cold demeanor about him. Initially after the attack, Richard was bragging about his actions, excitedly boasting that he might have killed up to as much as five cops that day. The police chief said that Richard's motives were largely unclear aside from that he was upset about recently losing his job. Changing his username to Braced for Fate shortly before the attacks is concerning, but it's unlikely that he knew his dog would pee, anger his mom, and result in her calling the police. Louis B. Schlesinger, a professor of forensic psychology at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, said, It was situationally triggered. The cops were called, he was in a very agitated state of mind, and he had a weapon. He just did it. I don't think it's much more complex than that. In the beginning, some speculated whether or not Richard's mother was involved in causing the ambush. Some felt that, at the least, she knew the cops would be ambushed by her son. A lot of rumors spread about her involvement, but it didn't seem that the rumors were ever taken too seriously. However, to this day, many still feel she was involved to some degree. Extremely negligent, if nothing else. Some of Richard's friends would end up being interviewed by various news agencies. One close friend said that Richard had greatly feared losing his right to own guns. Speaking of the guns, he said, They were all legal. He had about four guns. I've been in houses where they have gun cases with 20 guns. He had a small, small amount of guns. Another friend of his would say that he was preparing for the end of the world and that he had stockpiled bottled water and bags of rice. He said that he had so many weapons for, quote, protection. It seems like a bad dream, said a third friend of the shooter. I've known him all my life. He's not that type of person. Richard had also posted regularly on self-proclaimed white nationalist websites, where he talked about his fears that Obama would overturn the Second Amendment and how he believed that Jews controlled the media. He posted pictures of his tattoo, which was an Americanized version of the Iron Eagle. And uh, one of his posts pretty well outlines his beliefs in general. The federal government, mainstream media, and banking system in the United States are strongly under the influence of, if not completely controlled by, Zionist interest. An economic collapse of the financial system is inevitable, bringing with it some degree of civil unrest, if not outright balkanization of the continental U.S. civil-slash-revolutionary-slash-racial war. That's a mouthful. This collapse is likely engineered by the elite Jewish powers that be in order to make for a power and asset grab. The Anti-Defamation League came to state that Richard had expressed his frustration, saying that, Not enough attention was being focused on the evil of the Jews. People began to question whether or not the attack had been planned or premeditated. But, speculation aside, there were no indications that the attack was planned and the police struggled to find an actual motive. On April 21st in 2010, a spokesman for the Allegheny County District Attorney, Stephen Zapala, officially stated that he would be seeking the death penalty for Richard Poplowski. A county judge ordered police, investigators, attorneys, and court persons all not to discuss any details of the case with the media. The trial later took place, and on June 25th of 2011, the jury came to a conclusion. They delivered a verdict of guilty on three counts of first-degree homicide and all other counts, after only deliberating for four hours. Richard was convicted, and on the 28th, he was sentenced to death by lethal injection. He remains on death row. Eventually, the city of Pittsburgh condemned and demolished Richard's home in 2011, two years after the incident took place. Officers were happy to see the house get torn down. It understandably brought back bad memories every time they had to drive by the place. The vacant lot ended up being incorporated as a yard for a neighboring house. Memorials were erected in the killed officers' names at the Zone 5 police station. A park in Bloomfield was named after Officer Shulo, who had lived there. A baseball field in Brookline was dedicated to mail, and finally a field in Stanton Heights was named after Officer Kelly. The former public safety director Mike Huss is still haunted by the incident. He remembers the hours of constant gunfire. It's always with you. It never leaves, he said. I remember the courageous acts. Officer Mail engaged in a very aggressive, 
very courageous gunfight with him inside the residence. Eric Kelly did not have to be there that day, he chose to be there. How do you forget that sacrifice and what the families had to go through and what the Bureau had to go through? April 4th, 2009 still stands as the deadliest day for law enforcement in the history of Pittsburgh. An execution date was set for Richard Poplowski on March 3rd of 2017, but the date was postponed after he complained that his attorneys provided ineffective assistance of counsel. As of now, no new execution date has been set. Once again, thank you so much for watching my video. If you want to give it a like, it really helps it get seen by other people. And if you like dark content like this, please feel free to subscribe. That's what I do. If you really want to support the channel even farther, I do have a Patreon account. Speaking of which, a shout out to my top patrons. David McLaughlin, Marsh, Buffazerk, Lonro, Itaya, Jewel Mavchan, Lori Tayaba, Kemi Lu, Kim Peek, Lux Alpaca, Charity, Skooky Mane, Foxlicity, Jackie, Lavender Wise, and Tracer Ferguson. And as usual, you are the best. Thank you. Have a good night.